Hello, welcome back to 40 Days of the Fathers. We are on day 12, starting a new text, just in Martyr, his first apology. Um, this, this chapter deals with um, chapters 1 to 11 of his text, because it is hefty. And not long, long read, but very interesting, very worth it. So it's a new text, so I'll give you a who, what, why, when. So who was Justin Martyr? He was born in Samaria and was a philosopher who came to Christianity around 130 AD. He lived out the last part of his life in Rome, where he was martyred by beheading around 165 AD. Hence his name, Justin Martyr. It wasn't his actual surname. Um, Justin the Martyr is probably more accurate. What? is this text. It is a compelling defence and apologetic of the faith written to the Roman Emperor Antonius Pius and his adopted sons. And to give some context, he, Antonius Pius was the Roman Emperor from AD 138 to 161. Uh, why? Justin is demanding that the Emperor to investigate accusations and then just persecution against the Christians, so they, so they, so that they may at least face a fair trial. It's also believed that first apology was possibly written in response to Polycarp's martyrdom. And um, yeah, we mentioned that in Ignatius' section. Polycarp was also martyred. There is a text detailing that as well, which is well worth the read. Um, Polycarp was burned at the stake in Rome in the same year that Justin wrote this text. And it was written around 156 AD. So, let's get into it. <clears throat> Here we begin to have a look at one of the classic texts of the second century. Over the next six days we'll have, to, we'll have read the whole essay in a brief form here in this book. Though I would highly recommend making the time to read the full work itself alongside this, because there's so much to glean from it. And there really is. It goes into a lot of detail. And a lot of a good lot of insights to early early beliefs and doctrines and teachings in the church. Uh, the first of his major works that we still have, this defense of the, of the faith is addressed to the Roman Emperor with a very long name, and I'm probably gonna say it wrong. His uh, full name Caesar Titus Aelius Adrianus Antonius Augustus Pius, and his adopted sons and the Senate. Um, Antonius Pius for short. <laughs> Justin appeals to their sense of justice, love of reason, philosophy, and pursuit of truth in order to, in, in order that the charges often brought against Christians may be fully investigated to see whether any punishment should fall upon the Christian population or not. During this time, Christians were being punished purely for identifying as Christians, with little more evidence used against them than that, than maybe evil rumours which were doing the rounds. Justin argues that even with convicted criminals, they at least investigate the claims before punishing the person. But in the case of Christians, they only receive the name as proof against them, which is unjust. The emperor's sons were philosophers, which in Greek and Roman times was more like a profession, which had its own clothing style to display, to display this, similar to how you'd recognize a vicar or priest or whatever today by the, the white dog collar or the robes they wear. You know instantly what their profession is by what they're wearing. Same way any other uniform, I suppose. Um, so to this end, Justin argues that there, there are those who wear the garb of philosophers, but who do nothing worthy of their profession. Yet not all philosophers are punished for this just because they claim the name. Similarly, there are poets who would get a laugh by insulting the gods and who also taught atheism. Yet, contrary to how Christians were treated, the Romans bestowed prizes and honours upon those who you are phenomenally insult the gods. Why then should this be, asked Justin, especially since Christians pledge themselves to do no wickedness, yet, yet are still charged with atheism for teaching that the gods of old were in fact demons, deceiving the people, calling themselves by different names to be worshipped. 
Um, apparently, Socrates was killed by men driven with evil passion from demons for trying to bring these things to light and deliver men from the demons, and charged as an atheist and a profane person, a charge which was similar to the one which Christians were accused of. And just a little footnote about Socrates there. Socrates was also accused of corrupting the youth and of impiety, and he was executed for this in 399 BC, which um, comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, so here, just there's a nice contrast between the reasoning used by the Greeks in condemning Socrates and the pure reason, i.e. Jesus, which condemns them all for following demons. The word play is lost in English, but the word for reason is logos, which you might be more familiar with. And so he says that the Greeks used their own reasoning, logos, to pass judgment, but that they, along with the barbarians, were condemned by reason himself, or the Logos, who took shape and became man and was called Jesus Christ. It's because of this, Justin argues, that Christians denounce the gods as being wicked and impious demons. So Justin writing in Greek and uses the wordplay of Logos, meaning reason, um, your reasoning, your understanding, your rational thought, with the Logos, which is um, Jesus, but also in the early Christian Greek understanding, the Logos of God is the not just the word, but the reasoning and the rational thinking and logic of God. So Jesus embodies all of this, or the word of God embodies all of this, becomes flesh in Jesus. So Jesus is the physical embodiment of rational reasoning and logic. So just as in using that wordplay against the philosophers who pride themselves on being the most logos, if you like. And um, other little footnotes for you know, curiosity's sake. Um, barbarians, which we might think of as an insult. You know, you, you barbarian. <laughs> um, it's originally, they were people from Central and Northern Europe, mainly Germanic. In ancient Greece, barbarian simply meant someone who didn't speak Greek. And in Roman times, it had come to mean any and all foreigners. So he's not insulting people by calling them barbarians, he's just basically saying non-Greek foreigners. Um, so yeah, just a little bit there. And to modern ears, what Christians were accused of will probably sound strange, and you've noticed me say already, that their charge was that of atheism. You might be thinking, why were Christians charged with atheism? Surely that is the opposite of what Christians are. But back in the early 2nd century, atheism was a phrase which was applied to those who denied the Roman gods. Justin gladly admits this too, but with some added clarification, that we confess that we are atheists so far as the gods of this sort are concerned, but not with respect to the one most true God, the Father of Righteousness. So the Christians are, in a sense, how we are today even, atheists in regards to any and all other claims to gods and deities except for the one true God, the Father of all, the creator of everything, and Jesus Christ. So Justin makes the point that if the emperor is trying to, is going to try people for wrongdoing, that each one who is convicted may be punished as an evildoer and not as a Christian. So to judge them as a person by their life and deeds rather than an assumption of them due to their, the name they claim. So basically, if someone is a Christian but they broke the law, then judge them as such on that basis. Try them in the court. But if they're just someone who walks around and says, hi, I'm a Christian, you know, don't beat them up and put them in prison, just for that sake. The end part of these opening chapters close off with a denouncement of idols and their futility, since they are mere items crafted by men who are intemperate and who are practised in every vice, which is contrasted with the formless God who formed all things 
and who needs nothing offered to him, since he is the provider of all things. In speaking of how the true gods should be worshipped in contrast with the demonic practices of Roman gods, Justin explains that God accepts those only who imitate the excellences which reside in him, temperance, temperance and justice and philanthropy, and as many virtues as are peculiar to, to a God who is called by no proper name. So contrasted with the wicked demons who work with the lust of wickedness which is in every man, to draw them to all manner of vice, the Christian God is a stark contrast to those which the emperor is familiar, even with regards to the kingdom which he has heard Christians look for. You suppose, without making any inquiry, that we speak of a human kingdom, Justin says, but goes on to explain that it is not so with Christians, since their minds are fixed elsewhere. This ends the first 11 chapters of this massive and notable apologetic work. One of part one of six for these daily readings. So I hope you enjoy reading a great classic literary work. And um, it would take you a bit longer than the other texts so far if you wanted to read the whole of the first apology of Justin Martyr. It's well worth doing if you get the time. Um, but I hope, if not, that these summaries in here will give you a flavour for it. And uh, if you enjoyed it, thumb it up, subscribe to me. Um, buy the book and uh, maybe consider supporting me on Patreon where if you donate monthly amount, it doesn't have to be much, a few pounds, fiver or whatever, um, every time I put things out I'll post it on there and if I do new books, which I've got one that I'm writing at the moment, you can get some free ebooks and things as well for your continue support or get your name in the back of the book as a thanks so um that's the end of today's thanks for watching <laughs>